evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, if I could get someone to take up the offering, that would be great. Dalton, no, you're getting ready to come up here. Sam, you want to come do it for me? Or Avon? Or both. Yeah, take both. Go down both sides. Even better. Team effort. There we go. Uh, I've got just a couple of announcements. Do I? Okay, a couple of announcements. Don't forget, um, tomorrow at 1 p.m. is Have a Little Talk with Jesus at the home of Liz Fields. And ladies, if you were able to go and be a part of that, I encourage you to. Um, just to get together and pray one for another, lift up the needs of the church, the country, uh, anything you have need of. That's tomorrow at 1 p.m. Then tomorrow evening... Um, first thing that's going to be happening here is if you would like to be here when the Denver Fire Department comes, they're coming back tomorrow at 6, but if you want to be here for this, be here at 545. Uh, we will be presenting the check uh, from the offering that was raised during VBS. So we will be presenting that check to uh, the actual firemen that came, and, uh, and I don't know if the chief is coming or not sure but they're bringing the fire truck and the, uh, the firemen that were here. So that's going to take place tomorrow at 6. But be here at 545. You know, if you're late, uh, you'll miss it because it's going to be, here you go. <laughs> so, uh, but it's going to be a great time. And uh, we look forward to doing that and, uh, and blessing the Denver Fire Department. They were such a blessing um, to our Bible school. And we just want to be able to be a blessing to them. So that's tomorrow. Um, Okay, I just got that text. Uh, that's tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Then at 7 o'clock is family survival class. So if you would like to come uh, and be a part of that, uh, Robert and Lynn do a great job uh, teaching that. So please come out at 7 tomorrow for that. Don't forget Friday morning prayer at 615, Friday morning Bible study at 9 a.m. Uh, then the Pass More Baby Shower is coming up quickly. Uh, yeah, we can clap for that. That's a good thing. Uh, August the 15th um, from 11 to 1. And uh, if you can come out and drop off a gift and just spend some time, show some love for baby Malachi. That's quick to, to be here. I can't wait. Um, they are registered at babylist.com. And uh, just looking forward to a great day to celebrate uh, baby Malachi. Then Pastor Appreciation Sunday will be the, the next day, uh, August the 16th, and they're asking that you bring a meal. Is that correct? Uh, bring a meal for your family, um, plus more, and uh, a main dish, sides, dessert, and a drink. Um, whatever you would like, that would be great. Uh, and so we will eat after the AM service, and there will be no PM service on the 16th. Uh, Revival with Torrance Nash, August the 21st through the 23rd. I can't wait. It's going to be a great time. Um, service starts Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 7. Saturday night is deemed youth night. So all of you young people and young at hearts, please come out and be a part after the uh, service on Saturday night. We're going to have refreshments out in the field. Uh, looking forward to that. And then Sunday morning, having a great time. Uh, I'm just believing the Lord for great things uh, during this revival. Uh, September, I have to look at this, September 5th is going to be our big work day here at the church. And I know I'm kind of throwing that out there. We don't really have a slide, I don't think, um, for that. But September 5th, the wall's coming down. Is that right? Yes? Okay, not all at one time. The wall is going to start to come down. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Uh, but it's going to be great, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, doing this remodel. We thank you so much for Sunday uh, for supporting uh, the fundraiser meal with the hot dogs and the hamburgers. I believe at last count we raised close to $600. So that was a wonderful, uh, yeah. Clap for that, too. That was a wonderful thing. Um, <clears throat> and, hey, you were out of here by 1.30. You can never go out to eat on a Sunday and be done by 1.30. So that was, and it was probably before that because that was after cleanup and everything. So uh, we will be having more fundraiser meals, things like that. Um, so just stay tuned. 
get a bulletin, get a calendar so that you can keep up with all of that. And then lastly, uh, just looking ahead, ladies, September 26th, uh, we will be having a... Uh, a brunch on at 11 a.m. Uh, we will be having a special speaker, Cheryl Dorsey, and she is from King's Daughters Ministry. Um, so you don't want to miss this, but we do need you to sign up so that we know how to plan for food. Um, if you're watching by Facebook, uh, by the internet, please know that, ladies, you are invited uh, to be a part of this. You can message us. Uh, you can leave a, a comment on Facebook if you would like to come. Uh, there's no charge. We just need a head count on how many to prepare for but that will be Saturday September the 26th at 11 a.m. and uh, I am definitely looking forward to that then lastly if you have not filled out a card for the directory we need you to do so we've got new families new faces and we need to know how to get a hold of you and uh, so if you could fill out a card they're out there on the information desk you can fill it out and drop it in the offering plate um, that would be greatly appreciated prayer requests that uh, have come in please keep Johnny Frazier in your prayers he was in a, um, a really bad motorcycle accident needs a miracle Courtney Sapp, her uncle passed away, and then at the same time, now her dad is in the hospital unresponsive. So please keep Courtney uh, and that family in your prayers. Shirley Gulledge, um, prayers for pressure to leave her eyes. She just had eye surgery, and now the pressure is back. So please keep Shirley in your prayers. Uh, Danny Delancey's boss, his entire family is sick and needs healing. The Grantham family needs healing. And Lynn's friend, Lucinda, is praying and believing for a teaching position at a job where her son is. And then the Delancey neighborhood needs salvation. But I want to end on a praise report. Unit 626 is back on American Soul. Yay! <laughs> Uh, this is the unit that we have uh, supported, prayed for, all of these things, and, uh, and I am so, I was just so excited when I got the text today that they are in uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and uh, they will go through their debriefing and then make their way home in the next few weeks, uh, but just to know that they're back in America is, uh, is good news, and Jason's going to have the opportunity that when they come back to base uh, to be able to have a, a time of prayer and and things like that with them. So I am just so excited um, that they're back here. But continue to keep them in your prayers. And all of our military, all of our armed forces, as they're serving us here and abroad, uh, we just say thank you for, for all that they do. Are you ready to worship the Lord tonight? I know I am. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that tonight, God, we can come gather together, Lord, and freely worship you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, uh, for the freedoms that we still have in the United States of America, Lord. And God, I thank you for those that have fought for those freedoms, Lord. And I thank you for bringing Unit 626 home safely, Lord. And tonight, God, I just pray that you would touch each family, Lord, that you would touch each one, God, um, that's serving, Lord, that you would let them know that they're loved, that they're cared for, and that we lift them up in prayer daily. Lord, I pray right now for the, the lost, Lord, maybe family members, co-workers, friends, Lord. I pray that tonight, Lord, that your convicting power would go forth, Lord, that it would bring about conviction so strong that repentance takes place, Lord, and repentance unto salvation, Lord. We're claiming and believing for souls, Lord, for your kingdom. For those that are sick in their body, we know that you are still in the healing business, Lord, and we're believing you, God, to raise up those sick bodies to use them as testimonies of your healing power lord god we ask that tonight you would just be with us in a way lord that that we can even just feel you lord that we could just feel like we could reach out and touch you lord god we're asking for your holy spirit to just rain down in this house tonight lord that for this moment in time we would lay aside distractions lord and God, that we would focus on you, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
your great love. We won't be satisfied with anything ordinary. We won't be satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings, we want. Open up the sky, fall down like flies. We don't want anything but you. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down.
the good news is we can have more of him. We can have all that we can handle, just like I said last week, and then some, because he doesn't just fill us to the, the top, but he fills us to overflowing. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? I am so thankful that tonight I can give him the highest form of praise. What is that? That is my faith being anchored in his finished work. My faith not shifting from what was accomplished on Calvary's cross. That is the highest praise that we can give him. His Lord, I believe. I believe what you did was enough. Amen. That's it. If you love the Lord tonight, give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen and amen. He's good. And if you don't know you need him more, then I don't think you know him. I don't think you know the Jesus that I know. Because I need him more and more and more. Amen. At this time, our youth and children are dismissed to the back. Oh, I may need that. And for those of you that are staying in here, if you have your word, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And tonight um, we are going to be in verses first 12 through 14 and then verses 20 and 21. We're going to kind of skip around tonight. Um, Mark chapter 11 verses 12. 13 and 14, and then verses 20 and 21. If you're there, say amen. amen. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now verses 20 and 21. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And I know that tonight in here we have heard sermon after sermon after sermon on the fig tree. And uh, all of those have been great. But as I, I say quite often, if we ever get tired of the word of God, then there's a problem. Because the word is living, meaning it can speak something to you tonight that you never heard before, that you never realized before, and we must always uh, ask the Holy Spirit to keep our heart open, our ears attentive, our mind receptive to his word that's going forth, because his word is a living word, and his word will do what it's sent forth to do. It'll do a work tonight in each and every one of us if we will allow it to do that work. So I pray that tonight we do. Last week I began by saying that a lot can happen in a week. Uh, last week we talked about the triumphal entry and how all of those were gathered and they laid down their palm branches and their coats, their garments um, for the Lord Jesus to ride in on a donkey. And we must keep in mind that this is the last week of Jesus' life here on earth as a man that we're reading right now. His last week of earthly ministry, and boy, does he ever pack in as much teaching as he possibly can during this week. Uh, chapters 11 through 16 of Mark are all a, an account, a record of the last week of his life. And this text tonight is definitely a parable lived out before the disciples' very eyes. We know this text is speaking primarily to Israel. But we would be uh, in grave danger if we fail to realize and to heed the warning that he is here giving to all people. There's a warning being given to all people, to all believers and unbelievers alike. I'm speaking of the judgment of God that is to come. And I believe that it's coming quicker than we could ever imagine. 
Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't upset me for a moment if we didn't even make it out of the service tonight. If I went to read my next uh, paragraph and I was in heaven, praise the Lord, that would be great, right? That would be wonderful. But after that, there is a judgment to come. And a lot of times people, even Christians, believers, they don't want to think about that. They don't want to think about the judgment of God that is to come. But hear me tonight, those who claim to follow Christ are expected to bear fruit. And in fact, to not bear fruit is a sin. It's a sin to not bear fruit. Fruit will always be present in the lives of those who have been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you know that someone has come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because now fruit is evident in their life. They're not who they used to be. There has been a change. There's been a, a great change that has taken place. See, the Lord continually examines our lives expecting to find fruit. Just as he saw that fig tree afar off, as he drew closer to it, he was expecting to find fruit. The same is true for you and I tonight. I believe that everyone that's in the house uh, believes in the Lord, has confessed Him as their personal Savior. So tonight, as He is drawing near to us, why? Because we are drawing near to Him by being here tonight. He is expecting to find fruit in your life. That's why He's examining you tonight. Is, is there any fruit to be found so what has he found recently in examining you? Has he been able to find fruit of peace, of grace, of mercy, love? Or has it all been, uh, all he's been able to find is anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, hate, on and on and on. These are real things that the Lord finds when he looks into the life of his children. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. And only two people know the answer to that, and, and really only one, because sometimes we lie to ourselves so much that we've deceived ourselves into thinking we're okay. So really only one person knows the truth, and that's the only one that matters, and that's the Lord himself. And tonight, we've got to get honest with ourselves and invite the person of the Holy Spirit to come and examine our lives to see if there's really fruit in our lives. Because if we've been transformed, if we've been saved, there should be fruit. When fruit is produced, there is blessing. And when fruit is lacking, there is judgment and chastening. Now, I want you to get this. It doesn't mean when you're not bearing fruit that you're lost eternally. It means that the Lord is going to put you in situations. He's going to allow things to happen in your life. Thanks be to God that he loves us that much, right? That's going to purge us. That's going to cut away things in our life so that we can then start bearing fruit. So don't think tonight, oh, you know, maybe you already know. Well, I'm just not bearing fruit. I know I'm not bearing fruit. Well, you're in the right place because the Holy Spirit is here to do a work. He's to, to be that vine dresser that he promised us he would be and to do what needs to be done so that we can leave this place bearing fruit. He's desiring to do a work that each of us can leave. And you know me, I'm a visual person. I just think of us like the Jaquita woman, you know, the Jaquita banana woman with the bananas on her head. And so tonight we might have come in with nothing, but we can walk out with a hat of bananas. <laughs> You know, the Lord's that good. He loves us that much. And to think that he can just come in and he can do that work in our lives. And we can leave bearing fruit. Because, see, we could have come through those doors tonight mad, upset, frustrated, aggravated, overwhelmed. And we can leave with peace that passes all understanding. The Lord might even have you pull back into a fast food restaurant where you were short with somebody and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I've had to do that before. But thanks be to God that he loves me that much to allow me to do those things, to, to make right the wrongs that I've done. That's that chastening, that's that judgment before the judgment. 
right? So thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you that, that we're here tonight, that we can receive your word. We can allow your word to cut away those things, to, to pierce our hearts, to draw our hearts so that we can leave producing fruit, right? That's it. Um, we want to be able to leave here uh, being prepared to feed the gospel to everyone we come in contact with because that's ultimately the goal of the fruit that's bore in our lives is that he would be made known, that his gospel would go forth. Verse 12, I want to go back to that and read it of Mark chapter 11. And it says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Now, I want you to get this, that last week and now tonight, we are seeing the humanity of Jesus like never before. You see, last week in Mark um, chapter 11, verse 3, uh, we came across this, and it says that the Lord uh, has need of him. And I talked about how that just blew my mind, that the Lord would have need of something. He's the Lord. He's, he's God, right? He's Jesus, God in the flesh. But yet he had need of something. And then here tonight, we're told that Jesus was hungry. Humanity. We know that he was 100% God, but yet 100% man. These occurrences are proof that he was human. But we can never forget that he was fully God. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, Jesus experienced hunger. Jesus experienced thirst, weariness, pain, rejection, loneliness, even poverty. Why? So that he could identify with us. He did it all so that he might go to the cross and die for you and me. He didn't have to, but he did it willingly. He did it so he could experience life from our perspective and extend compassion and help to his people. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 tells us, For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as are we, yet without sin. He was tempted, but he never once sinned. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So many times, I, I think in my own life, I just, now I, I realize that when I'm reading in the Old Testament, all I can say is thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Jesus right? That makes you so thankful that Jesus came. But sometimes you can forget when you're in the New Testament and you're reading, Lord, I'm just so thankful that you came to this earth, that you took on flesh, Lord, so that you could feel what I felt. You could feel what, what I'm going through right now. He did it all for you and for me. Verse 13 of Mark chapter 11 says, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. So Jesus sees a fig tree in the distance and now has hope of nourishment. Another human attribute. He's hopeful, right? He's hopeful. So according to the appearance of the tree, there should have been figs, but instead he found nothing but leaves. It was fruitless. And Jesus was disappointed. Yet again, another human attribute. The fig tree had leaves and it looked promising, but yet there was no fruit there was no figs to be found. See, Mark stated that the time of figs had not yet arrived. Now, 
You can't let that throw you because that's not, it does not mean that Jesus was expecting something out of the ordinary. He wasn't, or that he was limited in his wisdom. Uh, well, he was Jesus. He should have known, right? That's not what that means. In fact, Jesus had every reason to expect to find figs on this tree at this time because while the figs were more prominent at other times of the year, it was not unusual to find early figs. And I like this. Um, Dr. Alan Carr said this. It says, the fig tree in view here is not a bush. It's a tree. And these fig trees can grow to the height of 20 to 30 feet with a trunk some three feet in diameter. The spread of the fig tree branches, branches can be 25 to 30 feet. In other words, fig trees can grow very, very large. And fig, fig trees are unusual in that they can produce as many as three crops a year. They can produce fruit three times a year. The first crop is produced on the old wood early in the year. Green knobs or buds appear at the end of branches. They are called pagum. And while this fruit is not as juicy and rich as the later fruit, it's still edible. And that's what Jesus was finding. That's what he had hoped to find. It should have been there. And after that appears, the fig tree will begin to grow its leaves in new growth. The fig tree is unique that it can be in full fruit, full leaf, and full bloom all at the same time. Wow. Wow. That tree can do some work, right? The first crop becomes ripe in June, the second in September, and sometimes there's a third crop even in December. So Jesus was disappointed because the tree had shown all the signs of having produced figs. He fully expected to find figs available to eat while it was in full leaf, showing great promise for fruit. The tree's looks had been deceiving. And I think you probably know where I'm going with this. Jesus approached the tree and he quickly realized that there was no fruit and his hunger would continue. Although the disciples didn't see the connection, but this is a perfect illustration of what was going on in Jerusalem. Remember last week. What was last week? Last week was the triumphal entry. Everybody had all of the leaves of religion showing. Right? Everybody was, Hosanna. Blessed be the, uh, the son of David. All of these things, they were singing praise to the Lord. All of the leaves of religion, but yet Jesus knew their hearts were far from him. It was all lip service. There was no real fruit there. The fig tree of Israel looked good outwardly, but Jesus knew their looks were quite deceiving and my prayer for a long time now has been Lord I don't want to miss you I don't want to get so busy that I miss you in the midst of all that I'm doing because religious activity can do that see Jesus was there riding in the midst of them and yet they missed him they missed him completely and that was a lot of religious activity that was going on. They were preparing for Passover. Passover is beginning. And they couldn't see Jesus for the event. They couldn't see him for the festivities, for all that's going on. And I can tell you time and time again, Jason and I will have these moments where we're just like, okay, Lord, is this really what you want us to do? Is this really the direction you want us to go in? And a lot of times there's been directions that we thought we were headed in, and the Lord's been like, no, and we have to stop as much as we want to do it. But he knew we would get lost in the, the hoopla, lost in the event, and miss him all the while. We cannot do that. As I said at the beginning, this passage is given primarily for Israel, but there is an application for all of us in these verse, verses. Even among Christian churches today, there's a lot of religious activity. We know the right words to say. We know the songs to sing. Uh, we know uh, when to lift our hands. We even know when to amen the preacher, um, when, the, when the word's going forth. And there are many trees that appear to be fruitful, but when you get close enough, there's no fruit being produced. And we have to individually on our own be honest enough, be real enough to say, Lord, is that me? Lord, I know you're near. I know you're here tonight. 
I know you're examining my heart, Lord, and I want to know what you're finding. But I'm here to tell you, even on the surface, if it doesn't seem like it's good, if you've allowed the Lord to find it, it's a good thing. Because then he'll take it. And in return, he'll give you what you need. But we've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to lay ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, search me, know me, change me, Lord. And I think since the beginning of 2020 and even at the close of 2019, that has been the reoccurring theme of almost every message. Change me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Because I want to be found fruitful. (laughs) Fruitful and faithful. Right? That's what we want the Lord to find when he searches our hearts. Faithfulness. You see, this tree had been given everything it needed to flourish. It sat in a good location. It grew in good soil. It enjoyed the sunshine and the rain, and yet it still was not fruitful. I talked about this on our um, Tuesday morning Bible study. We have to taste and see that the Lord is good ourselves. I can't let Jason eat something and me watch him and me expect to taste it. And I think that's what's happened a lot in the church today. Church members come. They come to every service every time the door is open. And they sit in the pews and the word goes forth and that's great. It's the anointed word of God and it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It is. But until we for ourselves take responsibility for our own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and taste and see that the Lord, he is good, then we're starving ourselves and fruit is not going to be produced. You might have a little bud here and there just from coming and sitting under sound doctrine, sound teaching. But there's more. There's so much more that he wants to produce in your life. And that only comes about by you taking responsibility, for me taking responsibility for my own relationship with the Lord. And I knew tonight was not going to be a shouting message. And that's okay. Because there are times our logo, our motto here is blessed, challenged, and changed. And I think Jason asked the question, when's the last time the gospel offended you? When's the last time you were challenged by the word of Almighty God? And I pray that tonight it is a challenging word. Because you know you. You know your daily habits, your daily routines. And it is only by and through a work of the Holy Spirit that he can come in and he can change that. And he can make that right. He can make it better. He can make it what he desires it to be. And we've got to allow him the latitude. Uh, You know, we tie the hands of the Lord. We frustrate the grace of God. He's always willing. He's always desiring to do a work in our life. But it's me. It's you that stops him from doing it when we think, oh, we're okay, we're in a good place, we come to church, we're, we're sitting under good teaching, we're, you know, doing all these right things. So did that, that fig tree. It had every benefit of flourishing, but yet it didn't. Right? And so the same can be applied to us if we don't take responsibility and feed ourselves. And we are so malnourished, we're so... Uh, depraved that no fruit is being produced in and through our lives. Let's face the truth today. We've been given every spiritual advantage God has to offer. We have his word. We have church and his Holy Spirit. He's blessed us in abundance. And there's no excuse for us being a fruitless branch. There's no excuse. There's not. It all falls on us. See, we have all the appearances of life. We use the right Bible. We sing the right songs. We preach the right message and walk the right path. And when people look at this church, they can see our leaves. They can see our leaves. But is there any fruit? There's a big difference. I don't want people to come because of the leaves. I want them to come and be fed the fruit And see, the fruit is lived out in our individual lives. Yes, there is corporate fruit, I guess you would say. But I think that's more so the leaves that people see. 
But when they come in, do they find people with hearts of, of kindness and gentleness and, and words of peace and love and grace and mercy? And I, I mean, honestly, I can say for the most part, yes. That's what people tell me when they visit here. I was just on the phone with an individual from California last night, and she was pouring out her heart to me and telling me how much she has grown and just watching our online services. And that just, you know, it thrills me. It, it, it excites me to know that people are growing in their walk with the Lord from this ministry. What a blessing. But what about our neighbors, you know? What about our, our family members? What about our coworkers? Those that we're with on a daily basis, they can see all these leaves of religion in our lives. But what about the fruit? And that's what the Lord is concerned about. That's his number one priority. Are we really in love with Jesus? Are we really in love with one another? Is he the centerpiece of all that we do? Is there real commitment to the Lord? Or do we merely give him lip service? And see, that's always the problem because, again, we can say all the right things, but our heart can be far from them. What about in your own individual life? Are you all leaves or do you have fruit? So I just want to take a minute to examine ourselves before the Lord, ask ourselves some questions, and this might help us realize, are we really bearing fruit or is it all leaves? Is Jesus really the first priority in your life? Or is his will, his worship, and his work just an afterthought? Is he your motivation for living, for doing everything that you do? Do you have all the trappings of religion and salvation but no real commitment to God? Do you shout, testify, and pretend to worship while you hold things in your heart against other people? Because the Lord's not buying it. He, he can't accept that kind of worship. He can't. A strange fire. Jason just preached that on the altar before the Lord. It's something that he cannot accept. He will not accept. Do you look and act, do you look and act safe at church but live like the devil everywhere else? Do you plan your life around all the things you want to do but don't see the need to plan around the Lord's work? Do you have real fruit in your life? And again, you know the answers to these questions. I don't. I can... Be fooled easily. Just ask somebody who took a trip with me to Chicago. I'm very fooled easily. I give money to people who pose as sky captains, and they're really homeless people that really want to just take your money and run. I'm easily fooled. <laughs> but the Lord is not. He's not fooled at all. He sees our hearts tonight. You see, fruit is always the evidence of genuine salvation. When a person is saved by God's grace, they will bear fruit for his glory. The fruit on the vine is evidence of life within the branch. And as the branch yields to the vine and the vine lives through the branch, fruit happens. What kind of fruit? Well, fruit of a changed life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Fruit of being a vibrant witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 1 and 8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Evidence of inward life growing inside of you. Not everyone bears the same amount of fruit. We know that, but everyone who is saved bears some kind of fruit. Every life, saved or lost, bears some sort of fruit. But it's only those that are in right relationship with the Lord that will bear His fruit. How do I know that? Matthew 7, 18 tells us that a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That's what it says. A good tree is the cross. A good tree is faith anchored in the finished work. A corrupt tree is faith that is anchored in what man can do, man's ways. So are you relying on the, the operating and moving of the Holy Spirit in your life 
to produce that fruit, or are you just trying to keep a list of rules and regulations? Just checking things off. Because if you are, that's a corrupt tree. And it will never bring forth good fruit. It never will, never has, never can. So when we are all leaf and no fruit, we're living in spiritual hypocrisy. And we are fit for nothing but judgment. And I know that's harsh. I know that's hard. But that's the word of God. And wouldn't you rather hear it now and make things right than to stand before him on the white throne judgment and say, why didn't somebody tell me? See, that's our responsibility to the flock is to tell you truth. And that is love, even if we know it's going to offend you. That's love. That's what a shepherd is to do. Protect his flock at all cost. No matter what. Even if it hurts your feelings and makes you mad. Trust me, if you're following the Lord and the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, you might whine and complain for a couple of days, but eventually you'll get over it. You will. I've been there. I'm there. Lord, no. Summer, yes. Okay. It's worth it, Lord, if it pleases you. Because that's what we're to, to do, to be about, is being pleasing unto the Lord, not pleasing to ourselves. So what does Jesus see again when he looks at your life? Christ-like character, right conduct, a faithful witness, lips that praise the Lord, generous in giving. Hear me tonight, you can't settle for shiny leaves. And don't try to cover your spiritual nakedness with religious fig leaves because God cannot be fooled. He knows what lies underneath those fig leaves. And that is a heart that is deceitfully wicked above everything else. That's what it is. And we try to cover it up. Oh, Lord, but I'm good. I go to church all the time. Right? We try to uh, present our case before the Lord. And all the while, he's like, I'm not hearing you. I know what's underneath those fig leaves. Now do something about it. Let me do something about it. Right? That's what he longs to do. So in verse 14, uh, because the fig tree was barren when it promised fruit, the Lord pronounced a curse upon it. He declared that it would be fruitless forever. And some people read this and uh, come to the conclusion that Jesus operated maybe out of anger. He operated hastily. No, that's not. Um, the phrase at the end of verse 13 says, for the time of figs was not yet come, and that's how people come to that um, but we've already discussed that, so we don't have to go in that any further. But if there were leaves on their tree, there should have been fruit as well. If there's leaves, there should be fruit. Jesus cursed the tree for its hypocrisy. See, the lack of fruit was not the reason for the curse. You need to get this tonight. The lack of fruit was not the reason for the curse. It was the pretense of the leaves. You understand what I'm saying? Don't be acting like somebody you know you're not. Don't slap the name of Jesus on something just so you can get a, an advancement. That's hypocrisy. And that's what angered Jesus. Had he saw the tree with nothing on it from afar off, it would have been a totally different story. But he saw leaves, meaning it should have fruit. So when people come to us because we've paraded around all of these leaves of religion, and yet we have nothing but our own opinion, our own thoughts, our own agendas to give them, that's hypocrisy. Because the only advice we should be given one to another is thus saith the Lord. This is what the Word of God has to say about this. Well, I'm not real sure. Let's go to the Word and see what the Word has to say about this situation. That's fruit. But anything other than that that we give to one another, that we parade around, that we post, that we tweet, whatever it may be, is hypocrisy. And that's what angers the Lord. That's what stirs up wrath within the Lord. Why? Because we should know better. We should know better. 
And again, I'm so thankful that tonight is tonight, that we're here, that we're, we're under the, the Holy Spirit, and he's, he's probing, he's prodding, he's, he's drawing our hearts, not to just punch us in the mouth and say, get out of here, but no, to allow his Holy Spirit to change us, to make us fruitful, to make us more fruitful. The tree was making promises it could not deliver. And that happens a lot in the church today. Straight out hypocrisy. Well, you've heard it. You've seen the commercials of preachers that will say, oh, send in a seed of faith of $1,000 and all your bills will be paid off. No, that's hypocrisy. That's not the word of God at all. But yet, that's what people think, but that angers the Lord. That stirs up wrath in the Lord. Again, this was a picture of the nation of Israel because they promised life but only delivered bondage and dead religion. They were continually trying to, to pull those new converts, those who had, came, uh, to a, who had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, pull them back into bondage, pull them back into the law. It was dead. It had nothing to offer, nothing uh, to give. And they were cursed as well. And we know from historical records that Israel was judged for the rejection of the Lord. They paid a high price for hypocrisy. They were destroyed by Rome in 70 AD. And the population that survived was scattered around the world. And the nation ceased to exist for nearly 1,900 years. I mean, think about that. 1,900 years, there was no nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was reborn in 1948, but they still stand under God's judgment to this day because they could have had him. They could have received him. He was there, but when he came to his own, his own received him not. That's what the word says. I just want to remind you that the same scenario can be played out in our lives today when we have the appearance of life but bear no fruit. We can expect a visit from the Lord. And I pray that that's taken place tonight. See, verse 13 again tells us uh, that the fig tree was afar off, but Jesus made an effort to go to that tree. He made an effort to go to that tree, and he will come to examine the fruit in our lives as well, if we are hypocritical and don't bear fruit, as he desires us to, he might just set us aside for a time. That was Paul's fear in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. It says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Wow, right? I mean, this is Paul we're talking about. This is also the promise of the husbandman to the branches in his vineyard, John 15 and 2. It says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. See, if we just make a pretense of religion by flaunting our leaves around but have no fruit, he will judge us too. He will judge us too. Uh, so what is that verse really saying? It's saying when the Lord sees a fruitless branch, he taketh it away. It doesn't mean that he cuts the branch out of the vine. But it does mean that he begins to work on that branch. And maybe if you've been to a greenhouse or a nursery before, um, you will see them and they use tape. And they'll tape a branch up trying to get it to reconnect so that it can bear fruit. The nurse, the, what do they call them? Yeah, they graft it in, but what's a nursery worker called? The husbandman, but I'm thinking about it in like today's times. What is an arborist, a horticulturist? Yeah, something like that. Okay, I, it doesn't matter. You know, we're all on the same page here. They take great time in being careful with this branch that has somehow become broken that has just kind of lost its way, so to speak. And they'll tape it up. They'll use 
green tape. They'll use white tape. I've seen lots of different colors of tapes on, on trees before. Just trying to get this branch to graft back in, right? And that's what the Lord's talking about here. He's, he's taken us away to do the work that needs to be done on us so that we can be grafted back in to the vine. He's not, he don't want to, if you're saved, you've, you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's not just going to cut you off and throw you in the fire. That's not what this is talking about. It's saying he's going to, if you will allow him, he'll take the necessary time to do what needs to be done to get you back connected and bearing fruit. That's how much he loves you. It says he lifts it up and trains it to grow like he intends it to grow. And I don't know if you notice this, but every branch receives his attention. Not just one, but every branch. Uh, when the Lord finds a branch again that will not yield to his efforts to train it up and make it fruitful, that branch will then experience the work of the vine dresser on a deeper and a more painful level. John 15, uh, 6 says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So again, this means that the, the, the branch is trimmed back. It's cut away. He's going to do some things that are going to be painful at times in our lives. But it's for our good. Anything that the Lord does in our lives, it's for our good and his glory. Always. All of this reminds... Um, Reminds us that those who know the Lord are expected to be fruitful branches. When we are not fruitful, we can expect a personal uh, attention, a personal visit of the vine dresser in our lives. He will come to us with chastisement to teach us, to train us to become more fruitful for his glory. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And bear with me, I'm, I'm almost through this. But it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh, speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chaseth. And I always say that wrong. Scourgeth. And every son whom he receives, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chaseth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For, the verily, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. If we will just hold on. And allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that he desires to do. Then there will be peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. Hold on. The fruit is coming. If we will allow him to do the work that needs to be done. Revelation 3 and 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's all he's asking us to do. Lord, I've made a mess of things. I've tried to do it myself, thereby killing all of the fruit that maybe was once there. But Lord, forgive me. Come. I want you to dress this vine. I want you to, to cut away those things that aren't pleasing. I want you to do what only you can do so that I can produce fruit for your glory. Then verses 20 and 21, the disciples heard when Jesus cursed the fig tree. The next day they passed and they saw that the fig tree was dried up from the roots, which that never happens. A, a, a tree never dries up from the roots. It always goes from the top down. The root system will normally be the last thing on a tree to die, but not this tree. 
Why? Because Jesus cursed it and it died from the roots up. And it's a picture of total destruction. I've said it before, a rotted root can never produce good fruit. It never can. It never will. So we've got to stop holding on to those roots that are rotted and say, Lord, dry them up. Take them. This is ultimately going to destroy me. Those little hidden sins in our lives, the Lord wants to dry them up. He wants to, to totally take them away from us. Why? Because if he doesn't, it will lead to destruction. Again, this tree is a picture of Israel. They had been judged by the Lord for their hypocrisy and their rejection of the Messiah, and they were destroyed from the root up. Here was the message of John the Baptist to Israel, Matthew 3 and 10. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Israel had not always been that way. There had been a time when they were fruitful and honoring the Lord. Now they are in rejection and hypocrisy and their fate is sealed. And they are cursed and they will be destroyed. But I want to remind you that if the Lord, and I know he can, can take a lost sinner, save his soul, bless his life, and he does, it's the same God who will judge if necessary. He will judge. He is a just God. And we can't think that the Lord ever winks at sin in our lives and just kind of sweeps it under the rug. He doesn't. That would make him a liar. If he can save you, and yes, he can, he also has to judge, and he will do that. Tonight, I just want to, to ask everybody if they would stand. And as we close... As I've said time and time again throughout this message tonight, I just want us to be real with the Lord, real with ourselves, and just take a moment, five minutes, and say, Lord, search me. I want to be fruitful. I don't want to be cut off and cast into the fire, Lord. See, he'll give us his grace. He'll give us his peace. You know, sin can be dealt with personally. But if we don't allow him to do it personally, then he'll do it openly. And that's where humiliation and embarrassment and all these things come about. But tonight, he's drawing us to a place to where he wants to deal with us one-on-one. -on -one. It's just between you and him. So don't let this moment pass you by. Allow the Lord to hear your heart tonight. And, and, and let him do the things that need to be done. Vanessa, go ahead and play. Make your way to the altar.
that once we make that decision, Lord, that you promise to always be with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, Lord, that you will stick closer than a brother, Lord, that you will see us through each and every trial, every storm, every circumstance, every mountaintop and every valley, oh, Lord. You are with us, Lord, and I thank you for that promise. I thank you, Lord, for your word that's going forth tonight, God, and I pray that it continue to sink deep in our hearts, Lord, that we would go back, Lord, that we would... Look up these scriptures, Lord, and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to continue, Lord, to purge us, to dress the vine, Lord, to make us more fruitful. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget, tomorrow at 1, Liz Fields, have a little talk with Jesus. Then if you want to be here for the fire department, uh, be here at 545 tomorrow evening and uh, family survival class at 7. Love you guys, and we'll see you soon.